Good morning and happy Mother's Day. We are so glad you are with us this morning. And what an honor it is that I'm able to stand before you today. Um, Pastor Ronnie has been so gracious to open up his uh, platform, open up the stage to allow me to share it with you this morning. And so we're going to go into this morning. This morning is continuing the same series, Get Over It that Pastor Ronnie has started, but this is the Mother's Day edition. And so we're going to jump right into this. I'm so thankful to be able to be here and to be able to bring the word to you. So let's just pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up this time to you. God, I pray that you would go before me in the word, that you would anoint the words that come out of my mouth, that it would open and pour forth into the hearts of those receiving today. I pray that you would do a work that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Mother's Day does a lot of things as I think through it. I kind of rummage through my mind, different stories, different thoughts, different ideas, uh, those mom memories you have. You know, Tana being born, of course, that's what made me a mother. And we were just talking about this uh, the other night that the whole time we just knew she was a boy. We just knew it. And back then, you really didn't find out beforehand whether they were a boy or a girl. And she came out, and I just remember Ronnie being dumbfounded. He's a girl. What am I going to do with a girl? Just such a funny story. And Tori was so tenacious in the womb. She was feisty. And because of that, we had intended on naming her Kayla that we had changed her name last minute and uh you know she she hadn't changed much for that that girl that is still the a tenacious girl to this day i even think through to my mom and memories i have with her and one of the the funniest ones i probably wasn't as funny to her but when we lived in rio Dosa, New mexico we'd go skiing every wednesday and she would go skiing with me and we'd get off we weren't quite brave enough to go up to the black um the black slopes so halfway up you could jump off and <laughs> so we would jump off the this lift and she fell every single time and now why that was so funny I don't know I don't know if it was the noise she made but it just became comical because I think she would talk to herself all the way up there how she wasn't gonna fall and she fell every time I even go to my sisters I'm the oldest of three girls and my baby sister, at two years old, she had this knack for getting into places and things she shouldn't be. And I, can, I know one day, mom was cleaning in the house, doing things that she does. And all of a sudden, she realized Angela wasn't in the house. And she couldn't figure out where she was. We lived in Rio Doso at that time. And we had a ladder set up against this cabin we lived in because um, the school the smokestack had fallen off. Well, mom's calling for Angela, Angela, and she could hear her, but she couldn't see her. And all of a sudden, whatever it was caused her to look up, and this sister of mine at two, year old, two years old is up top, this A-frame cabin, sitting at the top, uh, just to happy as can be. My mother is afraid of heights, has to climb the ladder and coax her to come to her. So she was like, okay, Angela, come here. Well, Angela starts to back away. Oh, my goodness. The stories of motherhood and the things that, it, the memories it can leave with you, so impactful. Well, you know, as women, we are all in different stages of motherhood, whether you've ever been a mother or not. And so I just kind of want to talk through those for a minute, those different stages. And I know you're sitting out there today, and you may be going, I, I, I know, I will never be a mom. This will still relate to you, I promise. Because I want you to think about this as I talk through this about your spiritual pregnancies, if you will. Those dreams, those callings, those things that you've longed for, that God has planted in your heart, and the places you may be today so here's the different stages of motherhood number one you have that expecting stage you've not yet received the miracle you may not even have yet conceived it and you know this starts I know for me started as a little girl I watched my granddaughter 
do the same thing as she loves on her babies and kisses them and will rock them back and forth. It is the cutest thing ever. But we all have a place, an expected stage that we know God is giving us gifts, giving us callings. He's placed a purpose in our hearts. And so some of us, you may be at the expecting stage. That toddler stage, you remember those stages? Yeah, that's the place where it's all crazy. It's brand new, but nothing in your house is in order. Hardly ever. Like, always toys everywhere. You clean, they're out. You clean, they're out. Besides all the food, and it's a crazy time. But so much fun because they're learning and they're growing and there's so many new things happening. You hit the adolescent stage. You hit that where they're anywhere from 5 to almost 10. And it's kind of the sweet spot. They fend for themselves. They've learned how to do the things, but they still love you. You remember that stage? They still think you're awesome. And that's kind of that sweet spot where you think you've arrived. Then you hit the teen years. And I decided to name this the battlefield. The battlefield. Now, I know this isn't true for all parents, but I guarantee you, most parents, you were either the cause of a battlefield or you're in the middle of a battlefield right now. But then they grow up and they move on or they get married or what have you, and you hit the empty nest. And, you know, Ronnie and I have just recently kind of been through that empty nest. And all of a sudden, everything that you've ever known for the last 20 years goes silent. And you're in a silent place. Now, again, relating back to, is this your spiritual walk? Is this what's happening? Then you have that grandparent stage. This is just a joy. I find it that it's a place, though, I spend reevaluating and wondering some of the what ifs or did we do enough or did we man I hope our kids do for their kids way better than we did you know a lot of that rethinking and rewondering and so again relate this back to your dream relate this back to your callings you know you are given and I said this earlier you're giving a purpose in this life and to that purpose, you'll give birth to your callings, your dreams, your giftings. So wherever you are in your walk with God, guess what? You have to get over it. And here's what I mean by that. That place that wants to speak death instead of life into your dreams, your gifts, your calling. You've got to get over that place that wants to highlight your mistakes over your victories. You've got to get over that place that want to call you not enough. When God says you are more than enough, you are more than plenty. And, you know, as a mom, there's so many expectations, there's titles, there's accomplish accomplishments that were demanded as a mom. I even Googled mothers of the Bible, and here were some of the titles. Four mothers to remember of the Bible. Ten unforgettable mothers. Six amazing moms of the Bible. Inspiring mothers of the Bible. Well, if you hear that, it sounds like all moms were like super wonderful in the Bible. And that's hard to live up to. Even harder to compare to. The women today that we're going to look at, the ones that I decided to use, it's not because of the accomplishments they made but because of the struggles that we can relate to and learn how to get over it. And so we're going to dive right into this this morning. I'm going to take some of those stages I gave to you, some of those six. I'm going to pick three, and three that really stuck out to me as I was praying over this and thinking about what to say to moms on Mother's Day. Um, one of the stages we find that we're in is that expecting stage that expecting stage. And in that expecting stage, a lot of times we hear the words, you are not enough. You are not enough. I've, I've seen moms who have walked through wanting so desperately to have a baby. 
and not being able to for whatever reason. And they begin to do the comparison and looking around and feeling they are not enough. Well, we're going to look at somebody today who walked through that same thing. And again, relate this back to your dreams, your callings, your giftings. You start looking around and doing the comparison. And you're going to find if you weigh yourself against others, you are never going to be enough. But who we're going to look at first is Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit of the story of Hannah. Verse 2, it says, And he had two wives. The name of one, of, of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Period. That right there, if we were not told any more of the story, if you're a woman, you could already know what's probably happening right there, especially if they were both wives to one man. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah, who was the husband, to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. You know, you may be in an expecting stage right now. And while you wait... While you're just waiting, you're waiting for the Lord to open a door of your gifts, of your calling. You're waiting for the, door to, the Lord to open a door uh, for you to receive just that longing to have a child. You're in it, the enemy. The enemy of your soul is whispering to your spirit, you are not enough. He wants to antagonize you and to make you miserable. But let's keep reading. In verse 9 it says, so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now I want to I want to talk a little bit what Shiloh is. Shiloh um, was a place of a major Israelite worship center before the building of the temple. But the meaning of the word Shiloh isn't real precise. However, it does have two meanings. One of the meanings it was thought to have is to mean he who it is, or the other thing had to do with peace. And we're going to get back to this. So anyway, she was finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. So we're going to take a little bit. Let's just evaluate this situation. Hannah and this family make this trek. The word says they do it year after year. And they are traveling to this place called Shiloh. This city also means tranquility town or Pleasantville. A word also used, I told you, is he whose it is, meaning it belongs to him. And year after year, Penina would take this opportunity as they're heading to this great worship center to provoke Hannah and to let her know she was not enough. Let me tell you right now, you are in Shiloh. You are in a place of worship. You are running to a God who it belongs to. This situation that you're in, if you find that you're in the expecting stage, it belongs to God. It belongs to God. He validates you. He validates you. He sees you. And he will come through for you. But here's the thing. You've got to fall before him. And this is what we see that Hannah did in verse 9. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed the, to the Lord and wept in anguish. Can you only imagine if you've known heartache of wanting so desperately for something and not seeing anything move, anything happen, and she was bitterly weeping. And, you know, even while you are bitter and even while you are hurt, 
even when it is ha happening for everyone else except for you, and you can't figure out why you aren't enough, you are in the expecting stage, but God has it all planned out for you. Even when people mistaken your sincerity for wickedness, just like we saw with Hannah, and in verse 12 it said, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, but only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. You're in this place. You pour your soul out before the Lord. Remember, it belongs to him. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Now, verse 17 says, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. Remember, they're in Shiloh. They're in the tranquil place or the Pleasantville place, the place of peace. Go in peace and the God of Israel grant you your petition, which you have asked of him. Let me tell you this morning, if this is where you are, go in peace because you are enough. Get over it and cast down that thought. Okay. Number two, a place you might be, if you're not in that expecting place, you've been past that, you know your dream, you know your calling, you've got your, your child that you've been waiting for, but you're in a battlefield right now. And I know many of us face that as moms. We've got different kinds of battles that we face. You know, fear, when you're in a battle, fear can drive you to be crazy. I'm just going to tell you. I mean, I may have been there once or twice. You can ask my girls. And there was one time, now I'll not tell the whole story because I didn't get permission from Tana to tell it, but when she was in high school, she had called us. She was at a football game. And she felt like she was in some in some danger <clears throat> and the danger she was in you know we rushed to the football field but this mama was mad and I was angry and I was going to take care of this situation well she proceeded to say mom if you do that I will not talk to you anymore she she was not going to be embarrassed but I'm telling you this mama bear was fixing to take care of a situation and handle it myself and thank goodness my daughter at that time had more wisdom than I did and let me know that I needed to cool my jets and calm down. And so we're actually going to look at a story like this with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And in Luke 2, 41 through 52, Mary faced a battlefield, if you will. Now, uh, I'm going to start reading. It says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, talking about Jesus, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then, then, they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And we're going to pause right there for a moment. And I want you to, again, we're going to assess this situation. Mary is the mother of Jesus who is now a teenager. That teenager who is 12, not yet 13, teenager, teenager. And, you know, that tween stage, is a, it's, it's a very interesting stage because I have found that that tween stage, they lose hearing and any sense of what actually is going on in the real world around them. Was that just me or was that you as well? 
Well, it says, after they had searched for Jesus for three days, mind you, I mean, they had traveled a day out already, and they came back three days searching, and they realized he wasn't there. I know we all think that Mary was probably very angelic. I mean, she was the mother of Jesus, handpicked by God himself that she must be perfect in all of her ways, somebody we could never compare to. But I want you to look at this. I mean, I can't even imagine the scolding she gave Jesus for staying at the temple while they had looked for him for three days. Everyone else is amazed at Jesus. He is beyond his years and understanding and comprehension of what is being said. But his parents were hurt. And they were upset. And she says to him, why would you treat us like this? You think she whispered that real kind and nice, like, oh, Jesus. Sweet, sweet Jesus, son of God. No. She had been frantically looking for him for three days. And when she does finally get to him, this is what she is saying. Why would you treat us like this? Why would you treat us like this? I have to look. My pages got messed up. I think when we think about this, this place of the battlefield, we want to think that we are in a place where we have dreams, we have visions, we have things we want God to do in our lives, and yet sometimes we hit a place where God has disappeared or we've messed up or we've missed it. We've misplaced it even. We've taken a wrong turn. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I have. Have you ever lost a kid? The panic. What if you've lost a dream? What if you've lost a, a, uh, an idea, a gift? Maybe you've set it aside and all of a sudden you're where you thought you were supposed to be and yet you want to turn and say, Why would you treat us like this? I want to tell you that God sees you right where you are. And the mistakes that you've made up until this point, he understands and he knows. You see, when we go back and we read, Jesus looks to his parents and he said, why wouldn't I be in my father's house? And it says that that Joseph and Mary didn't understand this. You see, you can't see the big picture of what is happening. You're in the middle of a battlefield. Do you understand? You can't see all that is happening. When our kids are teenagers, we hope and pray that they will make it out alive or we will make it out alive. We can't see the big picture. But here's what I love. That after he said this to his parents, to his mother and Joseph, who was married to Mary, that he says he went with them obediently. And at that point, he grew and he matured. And Mary pondered these things in her heart. She pondered these things in her heart. You know, this is the second time that she has done this. It happened the first time in Luke chapter 2 when she first was told she was going to conceive the Son of God. And she pondered all these things in her heart. You know, during this battlefield time, there's going to be a moment where you look back and you can see God was in that. God was in that. I thought I took a wrong turn there. God was in that. God worked all things out for good because I love him. I'm called according to his purpose. And these are the things we have to remember. Treasure up those things. Treasure up the things and and make sure that in the middle of a battle, in the middle of the things that seem like they're not going the way they should, where you've taken a wrong turn, where you've lost something, stop and ponder. And then get over the fact that you don't know how it's all going to turn out. Third thing we're going to look at is when things have gone silent. When things have gone silent. I talked to you about that empty nest syndrome stage. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about this, but I'm going to take a little different turn because the third person we're going to look at today, she never really quite hit empty nest. She was well past the age of empty nest, but she had not quite yet hit it. Sarah, that was married to Abraham in Genesis, was old enough to be an empty nester. And you know, this may be where you are. Maybe you have waited so long, so long for a promise that you're at the point that the only thing you can see is death of your dream. And that's all you see. Sarah was at the same place. She hadn't seen the promise come to pass. She was too old or so she thought. But in Genesis 17, 4, God promised Abraham he would be the father of many nations. And you go on to verse 15 and 16, and he recognizes Sarah. As a matter of fact, he changes her name from Sarai, which meant princess, to Sarah, which meant mother of nations. And as you go through, I'm going to let you go back and read this yourself, but as you go through and read, you're going to find Sarah tried to be a fixer. And if you really back it up, before we just make Sarah out to be a really bad person, she was actually very obedient. Her husband had taken her through some very um, trying times, and yet she stayed obedient. She stayed obedient. She stayed obedient. But she hit a time where she tried to fix it and created a bigger mess by having given Haggai her, her, ma her maid to Abraham and conceiving a son. Again, go back and read it. But here's the thing. Sarah suffered, and she waited, and she waited for a child of promise. I don't know about you, but I try to wiggle out of trials or suffering or anything that God's going to use to mature my faith. I love what Pastor Craig Crishaw says. He says, he calls these kind of actions, this is what he says. He says that's Christian atheism because Christians often live their lives lives as if God doesn't exist. That God, but the, here's the thing, God is not small or simple or short-sighted. He is eternal, he is all-powerful, and he is omniscient, and we are not. And you know, that goes back to the whole battlefield, but this comes over into this into this things gone silent stage. God is omniscient, all powerful, eternal. We are not. So we can't know his timing, his purposes, the way he's going to lay this out. You may feel like you're in a death situation, but let me tell you, there is life. Sarah still had life. And you may not have come to the place, but I want you to know, you haven't reached the end. It isn't time to give up yet. You need to go ahead and go, go back to school and finish that degree. You need to go ahead and write that book. You need to go ahead and chase that ministry to, uh, dream. You need to get over the fact that you're too old. You need to get over the fact that your opportunity has passed you by. You need to get over the thoughts that so easily entice. And if, you, and if you know you've been given a promise, a dream, a calling, you wait on God and you live for that dream. You live for that dream. You know, here's the thing is God did give Abraham and Sarah a baby. In our world, that would look like two little wrinkled senior citizens becoming new parents just as they qualify for Medicaid or Medicare. Isaac, their son, his name means laughter. And, you know, God has a sense of humor. He keeps his promises. And though Sarah previously laughed in disbelief, she now laughed with joy. And wanted her situation to be known. God had been faithful to his promise. And he blessed her in Genesis 21, 6 through 7. So here is what we have to know for this Mother's Day. Each of these stories that I told you ended with a promise being fulfilled. Hannah received her baby. And not only that, she had three more sons and two more daughters. 
Mary couldn't always understand where this calling to be the mother of Jesus would take her. But you know what she found in the end? Eternal life for everyone. Sarah, who made the mother of many nations through the birth of Isaac, that promise came true because her God is faithful and she gave, it gave her such joy and a legacy we still read about today. What are you feeling inadequate about? Today is not just to encourage our moms, but all of us. We all have seasons that we're going to go through. But through it all, what you have to do is you have to hang on to the promises of God. He is your peace. He is your Shiloh. He is your salvation. He is your faithful God. And I just want to call that out in you today. Today, as we close, one thing we always try to do is to offer a time of salvation. If you've, if you've come to this, to this life today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know you've got deep down things that only a God could put in there. I'm here to tell you he's here to meet you here today. And we want to pray for you. And as we do, we're going we're gonna to pray. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to have everybody bow your head and close your eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for your word. And thank you for your promises. I come today, Lord, confessing that I am a sinner. And I am need of a Savior. I pray that you would come into my heart. That you would renew my mind. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again. And today I confess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I give you praise and I give you glory for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so excited if that was you today. And listen, if you are in this journey, in this place, in this motherhood time, and one of these things spoke to you, reach out to me if you've got questions, you've got thoughts. We're excited for what God is doing through each and every one of you. I'm praying that you will have a very wonderful and blessed Mother's Day. And today, before we go, I want to send you out with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Have a great Mother's Day.